Go. Hey, there we are. We're live, Charles. Hey, how you doing, brother? How you doing? Happy Friday, man. Happy Friday. How you guys doing? How's your day? Well, you know, I, I, I the, the trash comes, the, the trash co collector comes every Tuesday. So I put it out today, and for some reason, he picked it up, and today is only Friday. Yeah. He normally picks up on Tuesday. What? You're in Waimea, right? Yeah. Tuesday. But he, oh, he picked it up today. But he picked it up today, Friday, right? Friday, yeah. Well, it's, it's Friday here in Wailua. Um, yeah, different different time zone. <laughs> that's what I thought. I know Waimea, Waimea was different. Uh, so how goes it, my friend? Hang on, let me just get my stuff going here. What another... It was a long day today for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, yep. It, it seemed that way anyway. Hey, oh, there we go. That's my volume. Okay. Anyway, thank you guys all for joining us tonight on this lovely Wednesday night. It's our trash day tomorrow, so that's how I know it's Wednesday, Charles. But yep. uh, yeah, we got a good sh we got a good show tonight. Bill Arakaki, uh, district area superintendent for the Department of Education, and his deputy, right on, uh, Paul right Zena, on. is going to be on. And uh, yep. we've been trying to get these guys on for quite a while, and they're going to be updating us. Uh, Bill is on his way out. I think he has uh, 21 days before he retires. And mm -hmm. then Paul will be taking over the helm. So it's going to be exciting and interesting. I think a lot of people have a lot of questions um, yep. regarding schools for their children and grandchildren. So if you folks have questions, uh, please put them in the comment box. Charlie and I will be trying to catch them all. I expect a lot of questions tonight. Uh, that's one thing. I mean, DOE for me anyway, we, we didn't get as much information on a daily basis as we did for everything else. So mm -hmm. uh, it will be a great opportunity for us to, to get some questions answered. But aside from that, hey, Rhonda Morris is on. Hello, Rhonda. Boy, uh, hey. we really got a lot of views we, we put you on. It was, she, and she, she behaved herself. You know, when she was on the show, Charlie, she really behaved herself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I was kind of surprised and uh, and happy. I was very happy that she was able to contain herself. But. Yeah. Well, don't forget, on. don't forget, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, if you're if you're on already, please share it. Please share it uh, on Facebook, you know, and and let everybody know. But today hasn't been a good day for me. It's been a it's been a struggling day, brother Mel. It's been a struggling day. Yeah, why don't we? Uh, why don't you share what what you went through today? Uh, yeah, it's like you are becoming the lightning rod or the magnet to COVID nineteen. Yeah, experiences. So why don't why don't you take a few minutes and share? Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll try to stay composed because I, I still have anger with those who don't believe that this is real. Uh, this morning, I I got a call from my daughter in Honolulu. <laughs> Uh, my granddaughter, her roommate, and my great grandson—they all live in a uh, in an apartment in Honolulu. Well, seven days ago, my granddaughter's roommate, she was having a hard time breathing, coughing, fever, one-on-one fever. She went to get tested at Kaiser, Honolulu. And before I go on. I got permission from my granddaughter to, to, to share with you folks because she said, you know, Papa, I think it's important because, you know, we watch your show and I think it's important that we get it out. Okay. So my granddaughter's roommate goes and gets tested. Apparently her symptoms started over a week ago. So when she went into Kaiser, it was <coughs> at the peak. Kaiser tested her for COVID and said that, you know, right now it doesn't look like she has COVID because she don't have the symptoms. She had coughing. Coughing and fever. She had coughing fever. and fever. Not and enough. Difficult, and difficulty breathing. Okay. Not enough. Not enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, why my day started off terrible <coughs> and I coughing now. So I get, I get COVID by abstentia. <laughs> but uh, well, I'm getting kind of where it is um, today, 
my granddaughter's roommate's uh, test results came back and she tested positive for COVID. So what had happened is my granddaughter <coughs> immediately rushed my great-grandson over to Kapi'olani Medical Center to get tested because he's in direct contact with this person. <coughs> so we're all worried, right? Kapi'olani denies my grandson a test stating that you got to get one doctor's note. And she said, wait a minute. We had direct contact. We got the results back today. We have direct contact. What are you talking about? And for about an hour, they put up a big fuss. I told my granddaughter, you know what? Go to the ER. Because apparently she was on the, the clinic side of the hospital. I said, go to the ER. I said, you tell the ER that you've been in direct contact and you don't know what that doctor that you talked to first was telling you because it didn't sound right. Well, my granddaughter went over to the ER, told the doctor, ER doctor what was going on. He immediately took my grandson in for testing. My granddaughter had to go back to Moana Lua to get tested. Okay. So she's there. Now I can tell you firsthand why I'm worried is because apparently the roommate got it. I mean, she's, she's weak. They finally, they took her in. She's in isolation right now. I'm not going to give out the name. All I know is she's in isolation. But she'll probably probably come out on the count tomorrow. So apparently contact tracing is now in, in operation. They contact my granddaughter because uh, they're going to tell her that, you know, she needs to go home and isolate. And they're going to call her uh, three times a day. And she's got to take a survey every day. Okay, so I know it's working. But then I know, because of all the information I've given my daughter, that they, my granddaughter and her roommate and my grandson, have been over their house for dinner. So just as a safety precaution, my daughter and my other granddaughter, my grandson, my son-in-law, and my granddaughter's boyfriend, they're all going to go get tested tomorrow at Queens. The brother... That has been a nightmare for me today. Because that, as you can imagine, I still have pins and needles. I'm wondering, man, I hope this thing don't go sideways. And you know, this girl, a roommate that's infected, she's not even 30 years of age. She's relatively young. So that kind of stuff, it, it, it really concerns me of the exposure, how she got it, where she got it. But I'm hoping that the contact tracers ask her all the right questions, you know? And if any of my grandchildren get it, you know, I can only ask God to please, you know, give them the wisdom to tell them everything, where they've been, what they've been through, and, and who they come in contact with. And even if they don't know the people where they were at, try to be specific, give them dates and time. They was in that area. Maybe somebody was close by that could have contacted them too. They might not know who the person is. And so that's how my day has been going so far, brother. Yeah, you know, and that we have been talking about this for a long time. And we have been told by countless um, leaders, countless decision makers that, you know, if you have come in contact with someone uh, positive, that you would get tested. And it's sad that uh, she was denied testing initially. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not, holding back on testing when it comes to these types of situations. And without saying the name of the, uh, name of the, the place, she, she works at a senior home as well, right? Yeah. So, yep. you know, um, how long has she been around that senior housing uh, facility? Um, a week, 10 days prior to, you know, how, we don't know how long she was carrying the virus before she tested positive. Yeah. Again, and that's why we, you know, Charlie, we for, for months now, we've been talking about the need for testing. We've heard the people talk about the importance of testing. And now as we start to open up on Kauai um, and Oahu and all over the state, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be more important now that we, we do not hold back on testing. That, in fact, if you believe you were in contact with someone, I'm curious to see tomorrow's numbers. 
Uh, and now, Charlie, you will have a firsthand um, source to make sure that these numbers are being counted. Because I question the validity of the numbers, I really do. But we, we shall see this, so uh, we'll get updates from Charlie every night. That's a good thing. So prayers go out to your family again, Charlie. Uh, Thank keep you, us brother. posted. Keep us posted and uh, appreciate you sharing. And uh, please tell your daughter and all those involved that we really appreciate them uh, allowing you to to share. So anyway, yeah. here we go. We have, we'll bring Bill and Paul. They're in the house. And they are here. Oh, boy. Hey, that's Avon. Is that the Avon, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> Look at Bill's hair. I know. Oh, I, 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 I got to go cut it pretty soon. I was, I, was you know, I was thinking, I was thinking, shit, Bill Arakaki going to be on Paul. Gonna be on. I better go wear my hat. And I said, ah. <laughs> but, yeah. Paul. Look at Paul's hair. Yeah. <laughs> I, this is homemade. <laughs> I don't have to worry about the barber. <laughs> Hey, Mel, you notice that uh, uh, Paul and I are on the left side of the screen. Well, I, Paul is on the lower left, and I'm on the upper right. But we get about the same haircut. <laughs> yeah. Well, we actually, haircut. you guys, on, on my screen, you both are on, Charlie, you're on the top left, and Paul's on the bottom left, and I'm on the top right, and Bill is on the bottom right. So. <laughs> um, but I really like that style, though, Bill. I mean, just like the old Waipahu days, boy. I know in the seventies, yeah, the eighties, I haircut same thing. <laughs> you went to Waipahu, yeah. huh? yeah, Bill? You you from Waipahu? I'm from I yeah, actually I I taught at Waipahu High School. Oh, okay. right yeah. on, right on. Yeah, I started teaching actually at Kailo High, coached there, then went to Waipahu after that. Here, that was so bizarre because. You know, when I moved to Honolulu for a couple of years, my first year, Kailua, my second year, Waipahu, I was following Bill Arakaki all over the place. <laughs> but anyway, thank you guys for joining us. We are uh, we come on about 10 minutes before and we kind of do like our, our, I don't know, it's not a monologue. I guess it's a duologue uh, with me and Charlie. And we talk about different things, but uh, we we're talking about, you know, the DOE and, and the, the parents of students, grandparents of students and students themselves. I uh, have a lot of questions that have had a lot of questions and, you know, things change every day. And uh, I got to say, I really appreciate the, uh, uh, the, the director. What's the Dewey? Uh, what's her name? Not, what's her title? Kimoto. Yeah. What's her title? She's like the. State State yeah. 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 Um, very. I, I enjoy watching her. I, I enjoy <laughs> watching her. Uh, at the press conference center when she does her, her she's very articulate and very uh, uh she speaks with an accent though i notice yes. a, she's what is, is she from um like brazil or something like that um there's there's some puerto rican background that she has yeah, i think yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. okay okay then she very, must be from oh. uh she's from makawao then okay i got yeah. it yeah. <laughs> she's from new york she's from the the bronx yeah oh, oh. Um, yeah yeah. Well, we're, we're very impressed with her and, and, uh, and, and so happy to have the two of you on. So uh, what we'll do, um, typically what we do is we, we, we turn it over to you guys. You guys can give us an update uh, and then we'll, we'll keep track of the comments and the questions. And as they come up, uh, we'll ask them. We, we filter out the junk because we often get some, some people that post junk and we just moving on. But any any questions that are, are uh, legitimate and valid will definitely be po will be posing. Um, so with that, Bill, you can start. What the, and congratulations on your uh, impending retirement in twenty <laughs> what twenty one days? Yeah, twenty some odd days. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, thank you for your service and 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 good luck yeah. uh, on your retirement. But yeah, why don't we start with um, you? Can say a little bit about yourselves and then give us the update of what's happening with with DOE. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much for allowing us to be here uh, to be able to um, inform uh, the public regarding what's happening with the Department of Education on Kauai. Uh, I've been, uh, I moved to Kauai in 1988, 32 years ago from Oahu, uh, and um, within the due, it's my 40th year. And uh, actually eight years on Oahu, and then the rest of my career has been on Kauai. So, um, you know, the families, the many key people 
uh, that are in leadership roles, parents and, and whomever, teachers uh, are former students and or also have their grandkids and others. So it's really a, a blessing to have uh, been here and to really work together with people like you folks uh, in the leadership roles uh, for Kauai. And, um, you know, uh, Paul will be uh, taking over as far as the CAS position on July 1st. Uh, uh, he has uh, uh, been a great asset to uh, education uh, on this island also. So um, that's kind of like our introduction and Paul can introduce uh, his background and things. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, I, not on the island quite as long as Bill. I moved here just before Iniki, um, and I, all my t all my time as a teacher and administrator, everything has been here on Kauai, and very lucky. Lived all around the island, uh, worked in all three complex areas, uh, lots of different experiences from opening new schools to being in really historic and traditional schools that have long-standing, you know, histories behind them. And just really looking forward and feel very fortunate that I've had this time these past few months working with Bill. Like nobody could have predicted the craziness that COVID brought on, but it has been a really unique and, and special learning experience for me to work alongside Bill during this time and see how, how much the island really comes together during times like this and, and just how much Kauai Strong really means something. Uh, and it's, it's something that uh, we really value, and I know that I'm going to have some really big shoes to fill and, and keep that spirit strong for us as we push forward in the DOE in the near future. Yeah, so um, as Paul had mentioned, you know, uh, your Hurricane Iniki, and actually uh, during that time, I was uh, training as an administrator with uh, Ernest Dela Cruz, uh, principal at Wilcox Elementary. So, you know, the unique and specialness of the island during that time. Um, Kawaii Aloha, you know, there was a video and all the entertainers and uh, singers uh, did, did that song, created that. So lessons learned from Iniki and now with COVID-19 and education, you know, how we on Kauai work together uh, is outstanding and inspirational. So as far as, you know, updates, um, tomorrow is the last day for students, uh, even though yeah, we're doing a virtual uh, distance learning type of uh, education to do. COVID-19 and Friday, uh, May 29th is the last day for teachers. Um, so, you know, the end of the year is uh, very busy for the principals. They're collecting devices, materials, textbooks, and other equipment and things from students as they close the school year. And also uh, parents and students are picking up their personal belongings. So that's what's been happening you know, this whole couple of weeks and today, tomorrow, and then on Friday, teachers will be um, last day to be leaving and taking their things uh, get ready for the summer. So with, with that being said, uh, our schools are providing summer programs uh, for students. And again, you know, the traditional summer school, you know, Kapa High School is, is doing that, but we have uh, uh, unofficial summer schools and learning hubs that are providing opportunities and uh, extended learning for students that may have not uh, been so successful during the third quarter and up into the fourth quarter right now. So uh, they are schools have identify uh, certain populations uh, to be able to bring them back uh, to school uh, during the summer and see how they can really support them uh, as the, we get into school year 2021. Now, as far as the learning hubs, we have uh, 11 schools that are uh, providing opportunity for students that uh, did not uh, meet proficiency or was not able to get connection to um, distance learning or the internet. So, you know, 11 of our 15 schools are participating with that. Also, we have a, a non-official, um, unofficial summer school, which again, 11 of our schools uh, are participating in providing students in the English language learner uh, population to support them with uh, extended learning this summer. So what's happening is, of course, um, in the summer, how do we ensure the safety, uh, health and safety for all of our students? So we do have guidelines that has been uh, presented by the CDC uh, and Department of Health as far as distancing, having the uh, sanitization, washing of hands, wearing of masks, and, and what needs to be done. So the summer period is kind of like a trial in which how things will work out because as we move into school year 
2021, you know, how does this work? How has, uh, you know, everything as far as uh, reconfiguring or uh, having that um, classroom structure or configuration to be able to bring in students? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the big question is, so what's gonna happen, you know, uh, as far as uh, opening of school? So again, this summer is to provide that opportunity for students that had a difficult time and to support them with uh, the face-to-face. -face. And again, with the CDC guidance, uh, it says no more than 10 students. So it'll be a nine to one ratio uh, at this time uh, for students to be able to come into the classroom and work with the teacher. And again, it's, it's not every student that's coming in, it's a certain number of students. So the facility can accommodate uh, that population. Um, so we do have the guidances now. It's, it's very important because people who are listening to this and many parents, you know, due to the COVID-19 and, you know, all the talk about, you know, a relapse and vaccinations and, you know, how do we really ensure that students and families and staff are safe on campus. So that is our priority. We want to make sure that uh, we, parents are confident, uh, our staff is confident that we're able to provide those securities uh, as um, students, staff, and even people that come to the office uh, for appointments and things uh, that we, yeah, meet those standards. Uh, it's very important that because I know some parents, even though we may have this summer programs, or as we start to look at what uh, how uh, school year 2020 open, uh, may choose not to have the child come in until there is more information or the depending what's happening worldwide or uh, in the United States or even Hawaii as far as uh, this situation. So we totally understand that. So um, at this time, as far as school year 2021, our principals are meeting with um, each other. You know, Hawaii is very small. So the East Central and West complex, you know, have a high school in each complex, a middle school in each complex, three elementary schools that feed into uh, those um, high schools and middle schools. So uh, it's, we call it the planning stages. There's nothing definite at this time. Uh, we want, first wanna make sure that we have all the sanitation, the cleaning procedures, uh, making sure that all the supplies and whatever is needed to maintain that uh, uh, when students return that, that it is safe. Um, the type of learning uh, will change because right now, you know, the distance learning or remote or online learning is what we did from spring break uh, and up until now, you know, many students had challenges where they were not connected, uh, no internet, uh, their devices was not working, well, got what broke or, you know, and how to even uh, understand and be connected to a teacher that is on the screen, you know, those kind of things. So. Um, we're looking at how we can improve, how can we provide um, training and professional development for teachers to make it if we need to continue and, and, and that's the kind of um, teaching and learning that needs to occur. Um, also with that, we, ha we have this uh, term called blended learning. So, you know, as uh, schools look at what they've been doing now as far as distance learning, it might be a blended type of learning where you will have the face-to-face uh, amount of students that uh, is required or allowed, you know, from our um, proclamations or resolutions from the mayor um, and CDC. So the combination of uh, students coming to school and a combination of distance learning, you know, how does that incorporate and how do we schedule that? Because as you may know, um, the traditional school of having everyone on campus, you know, our largest high school, which is over 1,300 or more students, and you have, you know, an elementary school like uh, Kapa Elementary, that is the second largest elementary school in our, in our state, we, you know, a little over 1,000 some of students. You know, how would you schedule and provide them, you know, uh, the being able to come on campus? So principals are talking to each other as far as, you know, what are they thinking as far as bringing students back? How do we schedule? They might have to be distance learning. And most of all, you know, as far as the students that are having difficulty, the vulnerable students. And at the elementary age, you know, we got kindergarten, preschool, kindergarten, and so on. So knowing the needs of the families, how do we um, ensure that we're able to, you know, service them and, you know, parents, you know, as far as childcare, you know, how do we mitigate uh, those kind of issues? Um, so the, the complex area schools like Waimea would be Waimea High School, Waimea Canyon, Keikaha, Kala Hill, and Ele Ele will be talking, okay, because a lot of the families 
have their siblings and brothers and sisters that will attend different uh, schools. So how do we do a schedule that will not impact or burden, you know, the family? So that's the discussions they're having. So it's a, it's a planning period. Now, nothing has been set yet. They're continuing to, to look on that. And to add to that is, um, you know, many students ride uh, the bus to school. So as you may know, with the social distancing, uh, a bus that uh, can usually hold 72 students uh, will be less than uh, with maybe 16 students on the bus. So how do we schedule transportation with uh, you know, these kind of uh, regulations that we need to follow? So there's, there's many, many um, aspects uh, regarding the planning as far as what's gonna happen in school year um, 2021. But the most important thing that I wanna emphasize is it's not only about the academics and delivery, you know, those kind of things, but we're looking at the social, emotional, uh, mental and physical well-being of our of our students, of our staff, and the parents, because we know that um, all of uh, all has been uh, challenged, and they have things that happen at home that we need to make sure that they're uh, are doing well or have resources that need to support them. So one of the big efforts is that uh, for the parents and for the guardians and the um, aunties and uncles and grandma grandpas that that support, you know. Uh, that, that child, uh, as far as education, you know, how do we provide resources for them? Uh, because with this new way of learning, uh, with the um, technology, is is challenging for many. You know, um, you know, Mel, you know, being uh, old, old school, old time, and just to even do these kind of meetings is a challenge. You know, for, for <laughs> even myself. Uh, but again, you know, how does that work with the families? You know, many maybe that generation that are able to really navigate through this and others may not, you know. So uh, all these um, uh, different uh, challenges and, you know, problems and issues are, are being uh, discussed at this time. So that's kind of like a general sense uh, as far as, you know, an updates. Again, it's, it's we're in the planning stages, uh, doing summer school and the learning hubs is going to be key to see how what um, uh, model will actually work. And with the summer school, just to add to that, we have this, uh, there's going to be a mobile learning lab. It's like, you know, the Iniki bus with uh, devices and uh, remote uh, internet connection. And again, it only can service um, up to 16 students. You know, we have a teacher uh, that will be working with uh, those students in identified areas. For example, you know, if uh, half, um, Lucy Wright Park or uh, Purple Beach Park or Lidgate Park might be areas in which uh, that would be a location because we have people that are living in that area in, cam in camps or are able to access and so we can provide uh, education during the summer. Uh, we have 11 schools that are interested so we only have one van and how do we um, determine you know uh, how can we pilot this uh, because that might be uh, a, mo a model to be used during the regular school year. So we're still working on that that um, that mobile learning app to see where we can. And we're also looking at maybe it could be based at a housing area where again, uh, internet connection might not be afforded. Uh, that would be able to service those students that were not able to connect and to have that face-to-face uh, -face, um, uh, kind of uh, education. So um, that, that's an overview as far as, you know, um, what, what's happening. And uh, Paul can add to the more details because uh, as far as, you know, um, what the actual, we, we did do questionnaires and data and surveys and great support from our, our um, leaders on Kauai, you know, Senator Kochi and, uh, you know, the legislatures, uh, the representatives that are part of our island and also with uh, many other agencies that are providing support for us to get funding and, and for support uh, for just for, for Kauai. So um, with that, I, mean, I, I talked kind of long, but, uh, I, I will have Paul kind of want to add because, um, you know, he's been really working uh, very hard and with the, the key groups the, that are supporting uh, Kauai now and for in the future. Thank you, Mr. Arakaki. I know there's a lot of information for everybody to process, <laughs> um, we, yeah, but there's a lot like happening. I, I, I felt like I was in school again, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Taking good notes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And oh, by the way, when you see us looking down, it's not because we're doing something else we're actually tracking the comments or or actually taking taking notes notes okay? so, <laughs> yeah. yeah so th there's there's a lot 
you know, of, of filling the gaps and details that we could add to that, but maybe it's a good time to see if there's, you know, something that you folks wanted to ask about, or if, if it's popping up on your screens there, we might be able to address a little bit of that. And then that might help us add some of the detail to what Bill's done, pretty comprehensive summary of everything. Okay. okay. Well, I have a question, uh, Mel. I want to I want to toss this question out. So, if if I heard correctly, because of uh, I guess the learning curve will now consist of utilizing computers, right? Connectivity, right? Um, if the classroom sizes are going to be smaller. What about those areas that don't have connecti uh, connectivity with uh, the internet and getting them the proper like Chromebooks or whatever they need? Because, you know, I guess some, some children, especially in, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm just tossing this out. You have some kids that are raised by their grandparents. The grandparents might not be too ma on using one computer. How can they get the lessons, you know, especially if they, they run into problems at home? How will those kind of issues be addressed? Yes, yes, definitely. And, um, you know, Paul can expand on this. As far as devices, many of our schools um, have their devices that are at the school site. The problem of getting it home is there is a code that they would not need to adjust so that they, if they did have internet that to be able to get onto the programs. So as far as devices, you know, we are looking at when they're returning, how many are broken, how many needs to be repaired. And then mm -hmm. as far as uh, added more so that we can have um, uh, these devices to go home, uh, we are looking at, um, we have some numbers in which uh, some of our Paul can share as far as uh, companies that are willing to provide a number of devices to help support as far as that. Now, when you talked about, uh, you know, grandpa, grandma, the, uh, the family members that are actually, you know, you know, there with the child and go, wow, how do you turn this on, Grandpa, Grandma? You know, and that kind of thing is very, very, very much so. We found out that that has been a big challenge and issue. So with the, um, the, the uh, resources and uh, support to the families, uh, if there is a, um, uh, what is that, a, a website or a link that would provide them, again, again, can they access that is another story. How do we provide that information and support to the families that uh, are not able uh, to understand and what is being done is a, is a number one uh, part of a big uh, list of uh, asks that we are having. So um, maybe Paul, you can kind of, um, because he did you know, the research and put together uh, the data that uh, we are using to, um, to send to our funders uh, regarding that, that questions. Yeah. Well, before you ask, before you go on Paul, let me ask you one quick question then. If would you folks consider the DOE consider maybe having volunteers that that are computer savvy that can go out and say maybe sit with those individuals who might not be that computer savvy, especially when grandma and grandpa going babysit the kid while mommy and daddy go back to work because of what's happening, and especially and, and then they can work with those people to say okay this is how you get it up and running and give them like a really a quick brief overview, but an effective one to get them online to help their kids. You, you and, folks. And definitely, you know, Mr. Iona, for Kauai, um, the community and partners and whoever is out there that have the expertise, uh, we work together. Uh, we are always willing to have them support us on that because we have many, uh, uh, a company that was a former student that is, is helping us uh, with those kind of things. And if we have many more, that'd be a great thing. So definitely for Kauai, you know, Kauai Strong Together We Can has been the philosophy. So yes, you know, that, that is a good point and we need your help. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, Paul. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the questions, these last couple of questions are right on the money. Um, they're right at the heart of what's really um, the underpinning needs of our entire school system on Kauai in the whole state for that matter well around the whole country re really um mm -hmm. and on Kauai um, as Bill's mentioned we've got a great team a good support team from the legislators the representatives Senate President Kochi Bill and I and various members of community support groups and and various large you know funding organizations that their mission their mission is really about managing a lot of um resources that can be, you know, that we can access. Um, but th that access comes with, you know, some IOUs. We, we can't do that irresponsibly, right? So 
we want to know, you know, with some real data, with some real numbers and, and feedback, even if it's just stories, like anecdotal feedback, but we need data. We need to be able to say, hey, this is our need. This is why we counted. And this is about what we have. And you mentioned connectivity. Like, so how many families don't have? We did a, you know, that was a question on a survey for us. So we have a number for that. And it, it's surprisingly small, but if you apply it to the whole community of Kauai, you know, we came up with about 8% of the students that need that, that just don't have internet, that report that they don't have internet to, to connect to this kind of learning. You know, that's a lot of kids, you know? I mean, that could be 750 students uh, for, a, for an island our size. And with that many kids needing access, we can't even have the next conversation until we fix that, right? We can't even talk about what learning will look like if they can't even get to the learning. So- Well, you know, we, we, we brought it up one, and, and I apologize for interrupting, but you know, because I get uh, short memories, <laughs> attention span. But we, we um, I know we talked with Kevin Matsunaga on his media program. And, what, and you know, we're, we're asking him that night. And I know that now with, with Spectrum, and that's what, probably one of the largest providers here on island, uh, uh, internet source uh, and cable source that would the DOE look at maybe trying to work with them to see if they can mobilize hotspots because they do it. I mean, they put it in a lot of restaurants. It's, it's hotspot by spectrum, give you one sign in log and that can reach instead of having each home hardwired for DOE purposes, they can, they can reach the masses. So if a code is given, it's given to just the, um, say the schools using it for the purposes of the kids being online. Would the DOE look at something like that? Yeah, they not only would, but we are. Um, so a big okay. part of the mobile labs that Bill's mentioned have exactly that kind of feature as part of them. So okay. they, they come in a lot of different forms. What connectivity, that's a big word, but what that looks like really varies. And, and there's a lot of ways. I mean, I'm, I'm not an IT specialist, but I do know that just with the work that we've done in the DOE and, and generally as teachers, we, we have to use connectivity to our advantage and, and to the best possible use. And what we have the most of right now is a real need to make sure that it's not just sort of haphazard donations of hotspots. Um, there's, there's safety filters and requirements on how the device has to be set up in a very special way to ensure the children's safety for all ages. Because remember, we're talking about three and four year olds all the way up to 18. And there's a lot of different needs in between, especially for the families too. Um, yes. Bill mm -hmm. mentioned a little bit about our community partners and how much we're trying to um, mobilize and, and use that to our advantage. And it really wouldn't have been without the help of Senate President Kochi and the other legislators that we were able to really gather quite a lot of different community supporters together and have them hear what our plans are for distance learning in the future. Yes. Those plans, uh, yeah, go ahead, Bill. To add to that, you know, uh, as far as Spectrum, uh, Representative uh, Jimmy Tokioka has a connection with Spectrum. So he was able to get us a map of the hotspots and how we can expand uh, so that, uh, you know, where they're at and what's missing and how do we, as far as the range, again, we're not another tech person. So, you know, thank you to, uh, you know, uh, Representative Tokioka regarding uh, being able to get that kind of information. And uh, Byron uh, Kapali, uh, which his mom used to work in uh, uh, the legislative office uh, in Oahu, uh, is our tech uh, IT person that has gone to the different vendors, we call it, maybe AT&T, Verizon, and others to see what the costs are. So again, with the support of many of our community members, uh, we are ahead of the game as far as you know, getting information out and really trying to get that accurate information that Paul, you know, has been really working hard uh, to, to get that so that we can present the material. Yeah, so the plan is really comprehensive. It involves getting access for the kids that don't have it, a very comprehensive training um, regimen that includes, you know, teachers having to teach in a really different environment. Not many people are used to this in, in the screen kind of format. Um, and we recognize that this isn't just a shift for the teachers and, in, and people in the school, including the students. It's a whole community shift. Like you mentioned, there are, this is happening at the home. Everybody all of a sudden became a teacher. I mean, whether they liked it or not, if you have school age children, you're a teacher right now, whether you like it or not. And that's a huge shift for people. So there's a lot of training that has to come from a very formal and very deliberate, you know, 
plan. And that plan, it, you know, I hate to say it, but it, it, it costs money. It costs, it costs us resources. And at the very least, a lot of human resources. We need people who know how to work with families, maybe in, out in the community. Like you mentioned, we bring the service to them if they cannot come to us. We, we have all these problems around transportation and, and physical space in the school with social distancing and trying to keep people healthy and safe. But learning has to continue. And our, that's our number one mission. Bill and I have been working very hard over the past few months to ensure that the thinking that has to happen on Kauai with our, our school leaders is happening so that they can be ready for a time where any contingency can be planned for. Because the reality is that's the only responsible way to, to, to respond to all of this is we have to plan for both options, as Bill mentioned. You know, There's a blended option where some in-person and some distance learning and it might be a little bit of in-person in the school as well, but we have to really have a plan for all of it. It, it. If we don't have those options at our fingertips, we don't know what the future is gonna hold. I don't think anybody does in terms of how the virus is gonna either evolve or not, but uh, we have to be ready for it one way or the other. I, I kind of wanted to go back to the beginning part of the discussion. You talked about the, the existing class, the current class that did not graduate, you're, you were saying that they will, they are going to have an opportunity to, to, to graduate through, um, was that distance learning as well? Or was that going to be face-to-face -face learning? How, how's that? And I'm sure it's a small percentage of the class, but nonetheless, uh, every, every senior that was not able to meet the requirements will have an opportunity, whether they have a computer or not. Yes, de definitely for the seniors, the class of 2020, the ones that did not pass a requirement to earn their diploma are continuing to have uh, uh, school teachers and others provide them uh, the distance learning. Now, again, when summer opens up and if, you know, whatever the structure is for them to be able to come on campus, uh, that is why we're having that summer hubs, learning hubs and uh, unofficial official summer school for the students that did not pass, did not make proficiency because they are having a hard time with just distance learning or not being able to connect. Now, also with that is uh, not only the seniors that may have not uh, passed the class or be proficient, it's also your juniors and under other classmen that may not have um, um, met proficiency because we ended the, and did the grades as far as the third quarter. Now, when you look at middle school, as far as students uh, that need to make requirements to be promoted to the ninth grade, you know, how do we support them? And then when you look at the elementary level, you know, they have their uh, standards-based grading that are well below and have not reached that uh, proficiency of the learning to be able to progress forward. You know, how do we support them, especially the younger age groups that are kindergarten, again, preschool, kindergarten, up to, you know, uh, the younger ages. So, um, again, schools um, have identified those that uh, need this kind of support. And uh, again, it's not every student, like you said, um, but again, principals are working hard to uh, really try to reach out and be able to see how they can support these students. Because again, some students may not be able to get to the school uh, and different things. So whatever challenges they're having, you know, they're working with them because it's gonna start in the next week and a half from now. Yeah, and if I could add to a little bit to that, Mel, to help kind of round out that answer a little, little, a lot of people are asking about what they keep hearing in the news about CARES Act money, and there's all this support that's being offered to the by the federal government, right? Um, Hawaii is no different. We've gotten our share of that, and the DOE has has a certain amount of that money, and a lot of it is being um, afforded to the schools through the complex areas uh, to help them with staffing and materials and other you know supplies that are needed to do those summer programs. And it is really uh, important to note that, that, that it is to support those kids who are the most vulnerable, yeah, that they couldn't access the learning during the fourth quarter. We, we really don't wanna leave them behind. And it's, I think it's super important that we're trying to close that gap for them. Um, I, I don't know if we'll ever be able to completely close it because 10 weeks of school is a long time to try to fix, um, but we'll have the summer and at least a, a four week period during the summer where principals can um, expand a program like that and, and identify those kids and get them in, even if it's in person, that they have to do it and to just make sure and abide by all the safety guidelines while they do it. I, I think just logistically, you know, physical space, the, the, the uh, available classrooms, you're, you're going to be dropping 
the room sizes down to nine per class or nine per teacher. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that's per classroom. I don't. I can't imagine you having more than one classroom or more than one class in a class. But um, so I mean, physical space. I just don't see. And, and I'm talking broadly statewide. I know there's there's some schools in, in Honolulu that are are low enrollment. But do we even have the space to accommodate a nine to one ratio here on Kauai? Um, and are we looking at possibly a hybrid? where you can actually run a physical class and those that are uh, not able to come in for whatever reason, whether it's on a rotational basis. In other words, you would have a live class, kind of like uh, some of the universities now where you, you have students in the class and a portion of the class is actually going to school online. And I think it would an 8%, that kinda, that's kind of low, that number, 8% of households without internet. That, that's kind of low. I, I thought it would be much higher. So I think we, if, if you use some, some hybrid technique, you could probably accommodate most of the, most of the students. Yes. No, I think the 8%, I think the 8 you was talking about, Mel, is that legally 8% of internet. Because <laughs> I know you're plenty illegal internet going on, right? <laughs> I apologize, I apologize for Charlie, because he's like that when he's, you can see already, he probably, he never eat yet, that's why, he never eat. <laughs> What's interesting is, you know, the internet connection, your, your iPhone and things can connect to different programs too. So, you know, as far as the internet within the household, there's different versions of how what people interpret that, that question. Oh, yeah. And yeah. To your answer now, um, your question about, you know, that hybrid, uh, that's what uh, the term as far as blended learning is what oh. schools are looking at. Um, because again, um, like, you know, high school, secondary, you know, with a large number. I mean, I think all of our schools, you know, their classes are between, you know, 20 to 30 some odd students per class. So mm -hmm. how are you going to have with that uh, number right now, nine to one to be able to have, you know, the bulk of your students coming in. So, um, yeah, so it'll be a blended where some students on certain days will be doing the online learning and some will be doing the face to face. You know, how does that work out? So again, um, you know, uh, Mahina at the West Side had, you know, talk, are talking to their staff and others to see how they can do uh, alpha order or, you know, grade level, how that would look. Uh, uh, same thing with the, the high schools in elementary. You know, how would we bring in uh, the younger kids for a couple hours a day? Uh, because, you know, to be able to do a full day might be a little challenging right now. And then the, uh, the um, upper level uh, elementary grades will be coming in on a certain day. So uh, it might not be every day, it'll be every other day or, or something similar to some kind of schedule like that with the, uh, the distance learning. And you know, as far as the, like, uh, the system with the UH and things, you know, are there companies or programs that we can also use uh, in line with what the teachers are also delivering that, that can be, um, you know, that is uh, very, enriching and uh, uh, engages the students. So, you know, there might be something out there that would be added to, you know, the curriculum uh, or the style of uh, what's going to be taught. And go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you a, a question, you know, and I, I, I don't know if this term is ever used, but it talks about rotation, rotative, where the schools will be open year round. So to accommodate the masses, you probably gonna have to rotate it. So then like when first, you know, I don't know if you do it by alphabetical order, last name, or whatever grades, and you take this certain amount, and then the next one shifts over. So you, you constantly, it's almost like the shell game. You're constantly moving bodies around so you can accommodate the entire map. Would you folks do something like that? That's what principals are discussing and gaining ideas from that. And just, yeah. just, okay, just hearing it from you guys, okay, this is Kauai, you know our graduation ceremonies, uh, it wasn't like, okay, Mr. Arakaki, you know, all of our high schools are going to do virtual and, you know, that, that kind of thing. What Kauai is so unique is the principals, uh, they went, uh, they asked their class of 2020 student representatives, they went to uh, teachers, staff, parents, and community groups to say, okay, for Waimea High School, for Kawa High School, for Kapa High School, you know, what do we want to do for our students? because this is their graduation 
alternate ceremony celebration. So each school did it specifically from the input from the whole Ohana community that comes to that school. So same thing with what's happening here with education. I am asking and, and offering the ability that, you know, whatever resource recommendations, suggestions that you have, we need to do this together as a community. And then for whatever community you live in, to be able to contact and work with that principal on what it may look like, because you know the deal we did put out, they're going to put out a survey to the parents um, on June first on you know how was it as far as education doing distance learning, what can be improved upon, how you are you know how are you doing as far as needing help and those kind of things, because it is very important that we get a lot of data and information from our specific people that are really with education in our, in, our, in our schools and community to be able to start planning and getting you know, that information from you folks. So we yeah, got definitely Kauai being Kauai, you know, we listen and we need to really hear from uh, those that uh, may have that these, always have these great ideas and, and how do we can do things like Charlie, what you're saying and, and Mel, you know, just the ideas coming up is something that is, uh, for, when we hear that, it's like, wow, okay, you know, we, we need to add that to what, what the plan is. Well, is, H, yeah. is HSTA going to be, uh, are they working along with you folks? Because I'm pretty sure it's going to be one union issue, right? Along the way. So <laughs> has that been addressed or it's it's waiting in the wings right now? I see Paul smiling. He can... <laughs> <laughs> I, I can probably say something about that. While we are not representatives of the union and cannot speak for them, I can say that they have worked in partnership with the DOE on a number of different issues for the employee Good. side of it. Um, and everybody is working for the same thing. We want what's best for the kids. And I, I, I believe it uh, in my, I believe it in my heart and from my observations of their behavior recently, I like that they've done things to expedite the process of getting agreements in place and trying to make sure that the teachers uh, have some clear guidance that's that's fair and equitable according to their contracts, right? I mean, we there's a lot of stuff to honor here. It's it's not just kids and everybody gives everything up to make that work. You know, that life has to happen and so does the professional and business side of life. Um, and so I think it's just a, it's a fair balance of those things. Um, everybody's trying to do what they can for that. And everybody's trying to give as much as they can for that. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that all the unions involved, it's not just HSTA, there are a number of other unions that are involved in this um, and that have workers in the school system that are all very important, essential. Every, in every union, there are essential workers that had to come in even during this, this pandemic. And, and we value all of them. We need to keep valuing all of them and keeping them healthy and safe and listening to their voices because they're a part of our community like everybody else. Yeah, um, one of the common comments and questions coming up on a thread and, and it ties directly into what you were just saying about the, the input process from parents, but uh, they're specifically asking, will there be opportunities for public meetings? Uh, and obviously it would be in a, in a virtual format more than likely. But uh, just to let you know, that's some of the, the comments coming across is, you know, ask if we'll ever, as far as the planning process, sounds like you guys are, you guys got a lot of work to do. Oh my gosh, it's <laughs> in, in a very short time to do it. And I hope the unions will, will understand that, you know, I, last night we had a short discussion about the unions, you know, now the unions actually, in my opinion, should take the leadership role and focus on getting the state back uh, on their feet. Um, before demanding, and you know, I, I got some hate mail for that, but at the end of the day, this is a pandemic, this is a crisis, the kids should be put first right now, uh, and then we can deal with all the, all the stuff later, uh, and, and, I, and I just hope, you know, the, the leadership can, can appreciate that and, and move that, because we got to get our kids educated, uh, and I did want to explain one thing because of Charlie's behavior, his <laughs> wife, no, his wife clarified it. He, she said, Charlie has a, had a very, had a great attendance record at Kamehameha School. Unfortunately, according to his mom and his brothers, it was at Kenny's Burger House, not at Kamehameha School. His attendance <laughs> record. Was hey, Kamehameha Camp Shopping Center, all the same. So come on, come on. Give me a break. <laughs> right there, it's right there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, tutoring, yeah. are there gonna be, yeah. are there gonna be opportunities for, uh, tutoring uh, special needs students that obviously is a very important uh, component in our educational system. Uh, how, how is that going to pan out? 
Yes, so um, right now we are going to start up the ESY, the extended school year for special needs students. Um, Chesney, Cabral, Kitamura, and Heidi Asferet are the uh, district educational officers uh, that are servicing or working with that special population with the, the many schools. So they are uh, confirming the school sites uh, as far as what rooms uh, and areas they're going to use for the special needs. So uh, they're going to identify those students that uh, according to their uh, IEP individual educational plan as far as uh, what their, their needs are. So that is being processed and also for the summer learning hubs, uh, special needs students and other vulnerable students are also able to participate in that, that learning uh, opportunity too. So again, principals uh, do know who their students are in those uh, different areas and then we'll identify and provide and get uh, contact to those parents. And when you mentioned about parent input, um, you know, all these suggestions that are coming out tonight uh, will relay back to the principals uh, to see how we can do that virtual meeting again. You know, um, and Paul would know as far as, you know, how many we can have at one time. I don't know how much people are, are here on this one, but uh, you know, the large number that we need to kind of get an open forum uh, like we did before on the call. We used to have those uh, uh, where we did talk about different topics, which is a uh, very uh, uh, enriching for us to kind of hear from them, you know. So um, we'll bring it back to the principal and see how we can coordinate uh, for uh, each school, if they're able to, or each complex area, East, Central, West, or different communities to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it can get kind of overwhelming. I know Zoom, the format that we use, you can have up to 100 people on the Zoom, which is, I can't imagine having, you know, everybody's picture would be about that big, but, and then, you know, then you have the ability to raise your hand and then people will get recognized, but <clears throat> uh, 100 might be a little too hard to, to control. But, you know, I mean, relatively small, maybe the PTA, PTSA, or, or some part of the, the representatives of the, of the parents. Uh, Again, you know, that, so that's why we like this show because we have right now we have like 151 people live that are actually commenting. And then after this, uh, you know, tomorrow morning we'll check. We'll probably have, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 viewers uh, views on this thing. So it's, it's really important to, to get out as much information as we can. Uh, and then I'll ask you at the end, you know, if, if, um, if there is such a number to call <laughs> for, for, for parents with, with questions, but... Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to scroll through all these questions, but there's, yeah, there's someone, quite a few. Someone just asked uh, about sports. You know, I guess, I, you know, when I moved to Kauai, I, I, I realized how important sports was for many of the schools. And uh, with what's happening now, do you foresee sports being being started again? Because we, we talked to uh, two coaches, uh, Sean Aguano and Dallas Correa, on the college level. And what changes they're going to have to adapt to, to uh, especially one with football, one with baseball, how to address the safety because you're going to be in close contact with, you know, in, in sports. How, how is the DOE looking at sports right now? Yeah, so that, that's a great question because, uh, and uh, say hello to Sean Aguano. He were able to, when uh, I was at Kapa High School, uh, coach with Sean and, and mm -hmm. the brother and Dawson and all these other uh, well-known athletes that were graduates from, from Kapal High School. Uh, we, yeah, definitely, um, you know, for uh, athletics, uh, Ray Fujino is the um, person that is uh, the go-to person for athletics. So what, uh, and Mahina Angwa is our um, KIF uh, president uh, for athletics. So she is calling a meeting with all the three principals who are part of the KF board to uh, talk about what, uh, what is the plan, just like how we're planning today, uh, as far as what it's gonna look like, as far as um, uh, ability to open sports. Now, meaning there might be delays uh, for our season to start, but again, as, you, as an athlete, you know, you, you know that even to start, uh, we have a start date, you know, whenever that will be, uh, we need to continue, we need to do some kind of practice for that so they don't get injured those kind of things. So those things need to be talked about and hashed out because again, what are the uh, parameters of the safe health and safety issues of social distancing and, you know, contact with students, you know, athletes, they're going to sweat, they're going to, you know, have all these kind of, uh, 
you know, uh, things while they exercise. So, you know, what would that look like? You know, UH, when you, they looked at, okay, will we do, we call it individuals where a certain position like running backs or receivers, linemen, maybe up to 10 of them will be doing a uh, uh, practice kind of thing. How would that look? So they're going to have a meeting to discuss that uh, with themselves. And then they're going to have a meeting with uh, Ray Kav um uh, Ray Fujino at the state level, because again, not only KIF, you have the OIA, you have the BIF and the MIL. So how do we make sure that we're consistent as far as how we're going to plan and look at um, re, uh, having athletics come back? Because again, if another island does something different, and how come Hawaii not doing that? You know, we really need to have this discussion amongst the um, executive directors, the athletic uh, um, directors and all, all these uh, key leaders within the, the athletic program. So that's been in the planning right now. In fact, you know, that was talked about at a principal's meeting today, not only as far as the school and activities, uh, educational, social, emotional, but it's also these uh, kind of um, as far as athletics and even clubs and other programs like KPAC, you know, our mm -hmm. group that does the, the, the plays and things, you know, I saw Hawaii Theater, they're going to do some uh, introduction back to that. So how would that look for our Kauai uh, students that are in the performing arts programs and so on? So yeah, yes, it is in the discussion stages. Thank you. So you talked earlier about um, the social and emotional needs that are you know so important for our kids at, at all levels. What is the DOE's plan? Again, another question from the viewers. Uh, DOE's plan to address that as we go forward uh, with this um, hybrid or blended learning model, because it's obviously gonna 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 affect that social component. So, and I understand you guys are still in the planning process, but what, what does that look like going forward? Yeah. So, so definitely from the start. Um, our Mukihana project, which is a school uh, behavioral health services, you know, we do have psychologists, social workers, and others that uh, if it were not in COVID-19, they'd be able to do home visits and do these many um, uh, support services. So right now it's um, remote, meaning they'll, they'll call, try to contact people, um, and it's very difficult at this time. So uh, on, and then we can give you the DOE website for Kauai, the webpage, uh, which has the um, each school's logo. And if you click onto that logo, you can, uh, parents and, and public can see, you know, what are services and different resources that they, they can they can access. But again, you know, not everyone will be able to go to that website because they don't have any connection. Um, if there is a, uh, a need, there is a hotline number that we can give uh, to parents to do a call uh, as far as support is needed because, you know, uh, many children, re even at this time, are facing um, uh, depression and anxieties and, and, and even with the family. So, you know, we do have a hotline number that, that somebody uh, will uh, manage and, and contact you for, you know, what you can get help immediately. And also, we can provide you the um, link uh, to the website for each school as far as who to contact, uh, as far as uh, counseling and, and different things. Now, again, moving forward, you know, how would that look like? As we return back to school, because again, it'll be blended, where you know we can have uh, meetings and you know with small groups. But again, what if the child cannot come? So how do we go to the do again the home site visits and so on? Because actually, some of our, um, uh, our workers have been putting information and going to the homes and putting it in the mailbox yeah, because you cannot you know contact. So um, Kauai being what Kauai is all about, you know we have our dedicated employees that will go out. And, and to the home and again, not, not intruding and not breaking any of the uh, uh, requirements as far as health and safety, but to provide and be able to uh, support the families with that. So even, you know, our VPs and many of our schools, uh, their staff has gone out to different areas when uh, there's no contact. Uh, now again, depends yet because some people may not want to answer and so on, but they're trying their best to support that. So okay. Paul, you you <laughs> big shoes to fill <laughs> yeah huge i mean and you take it taking over at a time <laughs> that's just not normal that's just i mean things and tomorrow it'll be different from today you know tomorrow there'll be a new development someplace and and 
I mean, share a little bit about what the hell is heck hell heck is going through <laughs> your your brain right now. I mean, I'm seeing you're like ready to roll, but like wow, just give us a little snapshot of your brain right now as you is all of these <laughs> that's a topics are coming out. That's a dangerous question. <laughs> Um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll say this, that there's no way I'm filling Bill's shoes. I you just, I don't think it's possible. I like to think of what I'm doing right now, more, more of just sort of walking alongside his footsteps, not, not even in the same footsteps. It's, um, too many years, too many relationships, too many really profoundly deep things that have gone on in his tenure as a, as a superintendent. Um, I, my, my, primary goal coming into the new role is to carry on all of those things that have worked so well for the community for our island and a lot of those things really hinge on some of the topics we've been talking about just some and there's so many more you know things about behavior health and the wellness and well-being of everybody cultural awareness of what's going on on Kauai for all the different you know role groups in every community it's got its own specific little climate culture yeah and learning those things I've learned it really just has to be done by being in those communities and listening to people. So you talk about those community meetings and Bill's mentioned how that really happens at the school level. And as a principal, I really felt that. Um, so I, I know that as a superintendent, I'm going to have to do the same thing. I'm going to have to listen a lot to people everywhere, not just in places that are comfortable for me, but to go to places that I know really important thinking is going on and really important perspectives are being shared and listen to them um, and bring those to a place where people's voices are being heard and they're being incorporated into the thinking and the planning that's happening. You know, you ask me like, what's going on in my mind? And I think of everything through that lens, you know, as much as I can. And I know that there's a lot of teaching and learning stuff. And I've spent my whole life as a teacher doing that, you know, not nearly as long as Bill, but only going on 25 years here soon. And that time, I'm not scared about the teaching and learning stuff. And as teachers evolving into superintendents, that's not the part that, that is um, what we consider the hard part. The hard part often we think about um, as the very small details that we didn't see and that creep up on us later. And we realize, wow, we didn't think about that yet. And the only way to avoid those as much as possible is to listen to as many people as possible. And so I keep coming back to that idea. Um, I know that, um, you know, on July 1st, that's the date for me. That's the date that I have to, you know, pull up my boots and, and get to work. And Bill told me something recently that I, I, I really took to heart and I plan um, a, lot of, a lot of my work around. And if nothing else, uh, those of you out there who know me, uh, I can talk. I mean, that's, I can talk a lot. Don't get me started. I know there's some Portuguese bones in me somewhere, um, <laughs> but, but it's not about that. It's about what can we do and how are we gonna measure, measure those results? And it's not often ourselves that get to put that ruler up against us. It's gonna be the public and everybody else that we serve. So, you know, come at this from a, a point of view of just serving, be measured. You're gonna be measured. I know I'm gonna be measured. I'm gonna fall short, I'm gonna exceed, I'm gonna do both. And I have to accept that that's all gonna be part of it. And I'm, and I'm okay with that. I, f I feel like I've got a good mentor in Bill and a great community to be to be with through that journey. You know, coming up this uh, coming school year, the 2021 year, uh, are we anticipating schedules going out so everybody knows when when everything is going to start and how it's going to start? Because I again, we this this whole hour has been uh, devoted to some of the ideas and concepts that we're going to try to develop to accommodate COVID and which, you know, Mel and I, we're, we're always coining the new term, the new norm. Mm. You know, school is not going to be like how school was before. Mm. First day of class, everybody goes. It's, it's, it, something's going to have to change. So do you folks have a scheduling that's going to be coming out that the people can attach to so at least they know? Because I think for these parents that's going to go back to work, especially after a lengthy layoff, you know, they, they're going to have to figure something out, especially if, uh, you know, the child, especially the young ones, if they're not going to be going back to school yet, you know, uh, child care and all of that, that that's going to come into play. So, go ahead. 
Yes, definitely. Once the schools come up with their schedule, as far as how it will look for the family so that they can plan and prepare, uh, may it be, you know, virtual and face-to-face -face and so on, so they can accommodate uh, what needs to be done as far as the child care. Uh, we want to do it as, as soon as possible. So, you know, two year, to, you know, date as far as usually starts is uh, the first week of August. Again, it may change. Yeah, you know, we may want to kind of come in earlier to get a head start, but again, that's not definite. So yes, we want to be able to put that out to the community so they are able to make adjustments to their work schedules and um, whatever they need to do to get uh, the child uh, uh, care. So I, I'm, I'm presuming then uh, this school year, things will be different on the roadway because we can tell when school starts because of the school buses, right? So I guess that's not gonna, probably won't be in a plan for a while. It'll certainly be different just because if you mentioned, if you remember earlier, the, the, the capacity of the buses with the right. constrictions of social distancing will definitely look different. Like we're not the bus company owners, but just to maintain the safety and the health of the kids in that environment with the current restrictions would be almost impossible. Like, you know, a bus would have to go, if you think about that, like 12 to 15 or 16 versus 72, that's yeah. like eight or seven or eight less, like times less. So it's like 700% decrease in the, in the amount. We can't make eight trips to school in the morning on the buses. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how, I mean, I'm just thinking practically. I'm not oh, trying to predict okay. anything, but <laughs> I, no, I I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about the poor senior citizen crossing guard. They got to stay at the crosswalk, maybe 10 hours a day now, <laughs> they're in traffic. Because right. of, those are real those logistics. Are, yeah. yeah, those are real yeah. logistics that, I don't know if anybody could honestly say there's a, a real definitive answer for it yet. There really isn't. Um, but it, it might be safe to say that just with the kind of thinking that the principals have already begun talking about, um, they're really being cognizant of the family's mm -hmm. needs. Like they're trying to get together as a complex and make sure that at least as a complex, they have some kind of a schedule that the parents can know, like they're, they're, all their kids are going to go to school, you know, at the same time. And it might not be every day, but we're really trying to be thoughtful about not splitting families up on different days and making it impossible for a family to go to work. You know, um, I, I, don't, I don't know how much control we actually have over that, but the, the principals are really trying to be thoughtful about whatever the schedule does look like and the things that they're considering so that they impact those families with as little as, as, little as they have to. Okay. That's, that's going to be, uh, I, I mean, I don't... Uh envy you folks that's got to come up with this plan because it's just it's, there's so many variables just a bus one i mean I, I don't know how you make that happen you know poor north shore guy is gonna have to leave at 2 30 in the morning the first bus run to get to school you know and it's not even funny but <clears throat> i mean if you think practically or logistically uh with with 12 or 15 people in a bus it's just not going to happen you think online education is is uh in the future of public school elementary and high school maybe not elementary but in an online education option like uh, some of the universities now? Yeah, that, that definitely is going to be part of the norm. You know, many, many years ago, they talked about uh, the classroom without walls. You know, how do you provide that? Um, it's not going on excursion of futures, but actually with this virtual world, uh, you know, having that uh, education component. So it's become part of life, you know, and more so how do we take advantage of the universities and other programs that uh, are able to provide uh, lessons learned from them. So it, it will definitely be part of education from now. So, you know, uh, it's here to stay. Well, I can tell you back in the 60s, <laughs> my, uh, my elementary uh, upbringing was done by virtual. Uh, that's why I wish Chekas and Pogo was still around. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Because that's where you're going to learn Sesame a lot from. Check us at Pogo. Yeah. Very Sesame Street Electric Company. Um, it's so funny. Somebody just posted, Paul, you came a long way from being a valet at Sharky's. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and that's one thing One thing on this show. We do not reveal the names of the people that post those things. But Rhonda Morris must have known you from back then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Bill, we're, we're, uh, we, we, we passed the hour, but, uh, you know, he was here for the hurricane and then the flooding, you know, yeah. the recent flooding, not recent is 2018, but you know, I think the DOE, I think you were very instrumental in that 
br brilliant idea to open up that restaurant uh, to have school. It was, it reminded me of the old Western movies where you watch the little schoolhouses where the kids would just sit around the schoolhouse. And that's, you know, I was out there one day um, and, and I happened to be there when they, <laughs> it was the first day of their school. And it was a brilliant idea. And, and that was something that on the fly, no one expected that to happen and, and it did. And now the pandemic. So uh, you, you've seen a lot over your, your years, but now what's the plans for Bill Arakaki? This is your moment, buddy. You can say whatever you like and nobody's watching. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, you know, again, thank you for this opportunity. And, you know, Kauai truly uh, is blessed with uh, the people uh, the efforts and uh, you know the community partners and everyone families that have really joined in to to make it happen you know the satellite school was uh developed and an idea from many uh components and input from the community the school administrators and so on so it's not one particular person it was a combination of everyone and that's why for Kauai iniki the april floods even uh, COVID. Uh, we will be Kauai strong and get through that. And you know, you guys talked about you know somebody being to uh, need to drive the bus or you know to do certain things. I'm I'm willing to be a volunteer and and do these kind of efforts. We'll be still connected to supporting our our families and so on. So you know, whenever there's a need, uh, of course you know I have to take care of my grandkids. So I might have to babysit every once in a while, kind of thing. But as far as being on Kauai and to be able to really you know, continue the programs and uh, the needs that we have, um, that that'll be my next journey uh, to really um, be out there again. Um, you know, it's, it's great to be up in this position to really see, you know, the great work that we uh, do together. But again, being grassroots with the students and or maybe even being on the field and being a referee or even coaching might be some, I don't know about coaching, but, you know, kind of really see, you know, what can, can be done is the next level. So. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll be around for whatever help me, uh, any group needs uh, to, uh, um, as long as I can do any kind of manpower, that kind of volunteer work, I'll, I'll be available. Oh boy, you guys I heard don't that. think you realized what he just said. Yeah, I don't know. If <laughs> you guys heard right, that. But it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I know, Bill, that they are in dire need of officials. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, and uh, that's just one thing I will not do. But, you know, I think after you cut your hair, you might actually might look like one uh, one official. You know, um, I, the other thing is I know the and I just want to make this announcement real quick. The uh, Dexter Kishida uh, was that is on actually watching this and and he wanted to or he posted that the emergency uh, feeding will end tomorrow for this season or this session, and then it'll start up again on June eighth to July seventeenth. So June eighth to July seventeenth. The summer feeding will be at Kekaha, Waimea, Koloa, Chiefest, and Kapa'a High. So June 8th to July 17th, the Kamehameha Day and 4th of July, they will not be serving. Uh, but that's not an amaz another amazing program. Dexter Kishida and all those volunteers that, that work on that program fed a lot of kids. We had Dexter on the show. Uh, the numbers just blew us away. 700,000 meals um, just, just blew us away. Um, aside from that, uh, any closing comments? Uh, you, you know that you guys have this venue anytime. So if you, your school schedule comes out or whatever you want, and you want an opportunity to share with Kauai, you know, please don't don't hesitate. Uh, I'm sure we'll be reaching out as well to to invite you guys back on. But I think tonight we had probably more questions tonight <laughs> than uh, on many of the other um, guests that we've had. And it's just that everybody's dying to know what, what to do with the kids. And, you know, we all know that the kids are so important uh, to all of us. So, Charlie, any well, closing thoughts? Well, I'd like to give uh, first, uh, Paul, you, do you have any closing thoughts before I make any comments there, Paul? I, I just want to thank you guys um, and everybody who's listening. Uh, the questions, just keep them coming. Stay engaged. Uh, find whatever avenue is comfortable for you to give your feedback and to get your input in. And everyone's voice needs to be heard. Um, and without that, Kauai is not Kauai. We we just need all our voices to be part of the decisions. And uh, thank you guys for the for the platform. This is great. Thank you. Well, 
I, I like to say in closing, first of all, I'd like to thank both of you for joining us tonight. Uh, you know, before you came on, I, 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 I'm going to share with you that I had a little conversation because uh, my, my grandchildren and my granddaughter got exposed to COVID and they, uh, the roommate tested positive today. And the reason why I'm, I'm kind of smiling, I'm kind of teary eyed is because I told everybody that was earlier today, that's how my day went. Well, during our session here, got a lot of words of prayers. I just got back uh, results of my uh, great grandson and my granddaughter and it came back negative. So I just want to thank everybody for your prayers. And that's all I can say. I, I'm glad it was you guys on this show. And I, you know, I really get to share that with all of you because boy, oh boy, it's been a rough year for me, but man, that's that's good news. That's good news. That is good news, man. That is awesome news for those of you, for uh, you guys too that don't know. Charlie lost his brother to COVID uh, uh, close to two months ago now. Uh, from he was in New York, he was one of the first first. Uh, uh, I don't know what you call them, casualties or whatever you want to call them. But uh, so Charlie's been very intimate with this whole process for for a couple of months now. Really, it's why we do what we do. To raise awareness and get everybody to understand that this stuff is not a joke this stuff is not a joke um and and schools can be a very dangerous place if we don't be careful so we appreciate you guys yep. taking the time i know a lot of people expect things to happen like that and it's not just government it's just we're dealing with with really uh public health and safety and and more so for our kids and for the teachers and everybody else so uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time that you need to make yes. sure it's safe for everybody. And Bill, 40 years of service, man. Thank you so much, buddy. Um, no, really, really. Uh, we worked together for a long time, and and you always been you always been uh, just a very strong advocate for for education for Koi. So uh, take care, be safe on your future journeys and your volunteerism, because tomorrow your phone ain't gonna stop ringing. <laughs> and Paul, welcome, welcome to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to the, the home the house of stress but anyway hey guys thank you so much uh we'll be back tomorrow night at seven o'clock and um we got actually uh i think i don't i don't even know who we got tomorrow night but i do know next week tuesday we have the lieutenant governor and next week friday we have uh, uh congressman Ed Case. and and on wednesday or thursday we talked about the prison release program where we have a very strong group that uh, are advocating for the release of prisoners. They will be our guests on either Wednesday or Thursday next week. So anyway, with that, guys, you guys stay safe. God bless. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Um, have have a great week. <laughs> Get back to work. Thank you. Love you guys. Take care, Take care everybody. Bless. Bye. Aloha.